Okay, so we're here today and we're going to do something really exciting, which is we're going to actually design a pretty basic e-commerce app. So that's an app which runs on iPhone, for example. So I've got a really weird setup. I've got my microphone so you can hear me better since the reverb in this room is fantastic. And I've got this camera over my shoulder. And this here is so that I, you can see what I'm working on down here. So I want to show you the basic processes I go through when I'm doing design, my thinking ideas, and also how I start creating little sketches, wireframes, and then taking it forward. So let's begin with the design thinking process. As we've covered in lectures, it's a um, six part step. We're going to focus on the first four. So you've got understanding got observation, you've got point of view, you've got ideation, then prototype and testing, so that's six points. So the first one is understanding, what are we trying to do? So for this scenario, we can imagine that the owner of Junk, which is a sustainable fashion company in Manchester, has come to me and said, I want you to design me a iPhone app because you want to expand what we're doing to a wider range. We want to keep our ethical values, but we think there's more to this. We could get all around the country, maybe nationally and internationally. So that's what we're doing. Observation. So I've already gone to the shop, I've been there quite a few times, had a look around, spoken to the people, and I've seen the online platforms. This here I've got on my screen is their website, which is pretty basic, but it's pretty functional and works. And we can see we've got things like we've got clothing, we've got jewellery, we've got you know, product pages, lots and lots of things. And I've also seen the current online offerings. Now, if you go onto your iPhone and have a look at their site, it's just the website made smaller. There's no scaling, there's no responsiveness. So we're working from complete blank canvas, which actually is pretty good because it gives you complete freedom to do whatever you like, rather than something that's existing, trying to bring it around. So that's what we're working on. Then we've got point of view. Now, it's normally I'd be talking to customers, talking to people working in the shop, talking to the manager, uh, maybe talk to suppliers, loads of people, and do lots of interviews and focus groups, get them to tell stories and all of this stuff. Obviously, being an example, we can't do that. So what I've done is I've just taken my observations and distilled it down into a few key points based on the tools given out in lectures. So let's start with... Um, our value proposition canvas, which is here. So hopefully you can see it quite nicely on our camera. And I'm going to zoom in a bit so we can see just there. So what we've got here, we have got the customer gains, jobs, and pains, as well as gain creators, um, products and services, and pain relievers. So we've covered this in the lecture, so you've already had a go at this. But let's have a look at what things are. So the gains from the customers from shopping here is that it's a very sort of young, cutting-edge brand, very traditional. People can save money because it's not expensive. It's a local business. They like supporting it. They like being ethical, like being unique. And then there's the whole tribal behavior of, you know, I'm a hipster and I like being um, wearing hipster-like clothing. The jobs people are trying to do is find unique ethical garments, um, evolve their personal uniqueness. So find something that isn't just saying how we are currently, but going a bit further. Maybe you waste time, so entertainment through shopping and browsing, which we all like to do. Then looking for gifts for yourself or for someone else. And over here, we've got the um, uh, propositions from the service point of view. Now, as we see here, there's much less done here than there is here, because the actual website is pretty limited, actually. So the pain relief is there's a Facebook social media, so they can interact that way. There's an online store, but it's very, very limited. There's not much on there. And you can walk into the store, but right now, we're not really doing very much um, to relieve the pain. So there's lots of opportunities for growth there. Now, don't worry if you've got this area very empty. It just means you have more opportunities to do what you like. Product and services, there's obviously the shop in Manchester. There's the e-commerce site, not m-commerce, remember? And festivals appearance there. So there's things that are there. There are products, there are services, you know, home delivery is one of them, but this really needs to be expanded on more. And then finally, the game creators. Um, we have not seeming too slick, that's actually quite important. Um, it's a very funky store, it promotes young designers, and it's got very friendly staff. So this is kind of where we are now. Now, during this, don't be afraid to get different color pens, so red or blue or black, and start putting ideas, hey, we could do these other things. So, when I was thinking about what could be game creators, I could say, well, 
why don't we allow people to sell their own items? A bit like Etsy and eBay. That's a, a model that's been very popular in Web 2.0. So we could take that further. Um, so you can actually go further with this. If you're doing this during interviews, you get much more detail, but that is always time for that. So then we actually went on to creating a mood board. So this is one I've made from various um, images online, and you'll see I've done some annotations. So firstly, this woman here, she's actually from their junkyard, junk shop website. So that's a real product they do, so it really sums up exactly where they are. But these other images here are found kind of sum up the aesthetic and uh, tribal lifestyle of the hipster. So we've got sort of women with amazing tattoos here, um, got some women sort of wearing kind of hunting gear, and a guy wearing the old-fashioned sort of bow tie and suit and glasses, the quiff and all that stuff. Now, a really interesting thing to point out is that all of these pictures have elements which hark back to you know, an olden time, maybe a hundred years ago. So these are kind of old school seer tattoos and you know, it's the old going out hunting, sort of David Crocker hat wilderness, old school glasses, check our working shirts, you know, the bow tie and check, really old. And you're really harking on the heritage here, which we do see over here. But at the same time, sailors and a hundred odd years ago where these tattoos originated from the heritage never had chest pieces like this women definitely didn't at the time and you didn't have all of this style so it's reinventing a past which didn't exist at all very much um in line with like the town hall so the gothic revival period reinvented the medieval architecture in the victorian image we're reinventing the victorian um, style in the modern image Anyway, um, interesting point to think about when you think about colours. So we've got some logos here, so School of Junk, that's a service they do. And you notice that it really blends the craft nature with the heraldry. Very much like we've got here, so the, um, the uh, esteem, the social status. It's a very, very middle class, if anything, um, position, but it arcs back to tradition and culture. Um, their own logo, Junk, which is purposely a bit scrappy. And I included the Manchester Bee here because I thought that's actually really relevant. It's flat design, very modern, symbolised city. It's really been taken aboard by the people of Manchester. So this does sum up things very well. I'd really like to include this because that's part of the... Um, it's part of the identity of Manchester. The um, uh, I want to say nationality, but not nationality. But you get where I am. Then finally I've got colours. Now I've chosen this pink and this blue to represent the brand. Now I originally took them from this symbol here, so in um, in InDesign I just selected these colours and just put them over. But then I realised that completely just by mistake that these images represent these colours really well. So this shade of pink in particular is present in his bow tie, in her um, high belt in her tattoos and in her belt. So that pink is definitely just naturally in there. Maybe it's unconsciously I've chosen that, but that's different there. And the blue, again, in her tattoos, in her checker shirt, in his jacket, the blue's all there. Now, we could say, hey, there's a bit of blue there, but the blue isn't really available. So we're really looking at um, something a bit different here. Um, so this is the mood board. Now you notice I've written upon it and does sketches, um, so it's highlighting colours. It's completely fine to do that. This is a working item. It's not a thing you're going to show your boss necessarily. So what we've got here, um, I wanted to show um, some of the psychology. So using the Pinterest board with all the items, I picked out the key areas. So femininity, tranquility, lovingness. Um, and the spiral is a symbol which is very in line with the... Um, actor dynamic modern femininity which the brand is trying to represent and on the um, masculine side which is the blue um, blue gives the psychology of integrity professionalism and success obviously not limited to women not sorry not limited men not limited to women but we tend to associate these items with that color and these are generally more masculine properties using the word very very lightly and generally um, what's a traditionally masculine um, and the sort of masculinity square uh, what's a symbol of a square goes very well with masculinity with the colour blue and with the psychologically so with these links but remember just as we got here with the um, images of you know, the hipster generation 
it's completely blending. So it's completely fine. It actually works really well to take traits which are traditionally seen as feminine and applied to men and vice versa, particularly in um, settings you wouldn't expect. Now, one of the really interesting things is that, to go back to when I was at university in 2002, the woman who invented the term metrosexual, which you might know of, said that, you know, at the time, 2002, metrosexual was the big thing, and this hipster thing hadn't come around yet. And she said, hey, the next big thing is going to be ubersexual, which is the idea of a man being very, very masculine, you know, um, so very fit, very outgoing, you know, embedding all these traditionally masculine properties, but at the same time being very, very caring and being very in touch with himself, very um, affectionate. And we kind of see that very much in the um, hipster thing here, which has come to true. Obviously, she's got the name wrong, but that's fine. In that, we've got the whole sort of... He definitely cares for himself, but he's also embodying too. Anyway, mixing and matching is a great idea. Moving on from the mood board. So here we have um, a spectrum here. And we've been over this in, cl in class. So where do you think the brand sits? Uh, is it personal or friendly? Is it corporate and professional? So I've taken my take on where I believe the brand to be. So I'm a stakeholder of one, but we could do this in... Um, you could do this in interviews and don't forget that it's completely fine for you to go hey let's have a few different things here so the owner puts it there but the state the shop worker puts it there anyhow so we've taken this and then just highlighted the words here which i think kind of we should be working towards now we see here in the center we've got um I'm very much in the middle, so I'm kind of ignoring this to a degree. I mean, maybe this should be sort of around here a bit to make it a bit more fancy, but this one, I don't have to concern myself with too much. These other ones are so strongly represented. So what I've done is, just like with the mood board, I've taken this and I've had a lot of fun with it and done a bit of research. So um, using symbols which are seen as being part of the hipster tribe, uh, using symbols which associate with these terms like tradition, fun, accessible, spontaneous, personable, um, more of this on Pinterest, if you go to digital branding board. I've just brought out the parts which I think associate well with this. And of course, in a um, interview, you can do this at a workshop by having these ready-made, cut out, and getting people to select from a pack of cards or something. But I'm just sketching because I like sketching, and it really helps me you know, discover what I'm doing. It's quite fun and relaxing. Remember, fun is a good part of creativity. So what we've got here, um, you know, we've got, I call him Mr. H. Fox, or Mr. Hipster Fox. He's, you know, he, the fox is an animal which does um, represent intelligence, cunning, and slyness, but also a degree of elegance. Adding this glass and bow tie as a um, fun element, as retro and as playful. Um, wood is a material and um, a style which presents the idea of um, wisdom, integrity, and depth. So these are all things we can reassociate with this. Um, the old school tattoos, which are quite prevalent, and we see them there, and it's almost like you've got to have one to be part of the tribe, not necessarily. And you know, these really beautiful sort of old anchor tattoos, you know, the pinwheels, the hearts, which is a symbol which presents caring, compassion, emotion. Um, we've got the tribal swirl, the transformation, combination, creativity, change, new life, harmony. It's all psychologically linked to this kind of symbol. Um, and I noticed also whilst doing this, that flat design is a really important part. Not all of these tattoos happen to have flat design functions. I thought, that's really interesting and I kind of like that. So I want to kind of retain that amount. Now these kind of old school tattoos, they, they speak of artisan tradition and caring, which we're really seeing links between symbols. So taking these areas here and going a bit deeper, bringing out the symbols, really gets me to understand that we're talking about a brand, a brand which again, shown here as well, where emotional intelligence, caring, connectivity, honesty is a really important part of him. And this led me to think about, you know, we've got, you know, <laughs> The hipster drink of choice, artisanal, artisanal, ethical, fresh espresso, one of my favourite drinks, um, absolutely coffee fiend. Um, so that's kind of there. I'm not sure I can bring this in there, but not. But this gives me memories and ideas that I can definitely play with and definitely draw on. 
um, we're looking at I'll go very fast here. We're looking at um, what kind of symbology, what kind of aesthetic. And we've got the flatness here, but also geometry plays a really important part in the aesthetics that we see around here. So these kind of sort of like simple geometric logos. And that reminded me of, I said before with here, how the modern trail behavior is the, you know, us reimagining 100 years ago, and 100 years ago it was the Victorians reimagining the medieval past with the Gothic revival. Um, in medieval times, people used to draw these symbols. And if you go to real churches and buildings, you'll see like interconnected circles that can be drawn like that. And these were, I think they're called witch wheels. I'm not sure of the name. But people would get a compass, so you see dots in the center, and they would actually draw, carve these into the stone to ward off witches. And I thought, actually, what we've got here? It's a very similar aesthetic, a very similar style, and it's drawing upon the history. And, you know, these kind of things, you can, you can see a link very differently in the aesthetic. So I'm wondering, is there room to fit in these kind of symbols? Maybe not, but it really gets your ideas flowing in a certain direction. So carrying on, um, the VW camper van fits really well inside here. You can imagine a VW camper van emblazoned with all of these symbols that look really cool and fit ni really nicely in with the personality spectrum of the brand. And this um, goes very much in line, all of this goes in line with the particularly Scandinavian view of aesthetics and design, which is incredibly beautiful, which is honesty, which we can see around here again. And that principle is very much, it looks like wood because it's wood. It's not something that's made to look like wood, it actually is wood, it is metal, it is concrete. Now, unlike this table, this is a laminate. Um, I'm not using plastic or synthetics. Now, you could argue that, hey, we can use plastic, it looks like plastic because it is plastic, but that's not really in the ethos what we're talking about here. So we're looking at traditional materials, which again, is down to this word here. This is something we've really got to embody. To a degree, that's a challenge, because we're using a medium, which is our iPhone, and I'm trying to turn thing off, <laughs> an iPhone, that really is a modern item. There's nothing traditional about this in any way, but we've got to get tradition into there. So this is kind of harking back onto the symbology we use. Now, I would love to send out a hand-printed magazine brochure to people, but we're using the, using the iPhone medium, so, we have to use these symbologies. If we don't, then we're not going to get this degree of honesty. Um, if it looks too modern, it won't go with the brand. You know, something which really, really slick and modern won't relate to this. So that's really important. And then it's got me thinking about other things. So I've done some little sketches down here, a few notes. So we've got scarcity. So accessible to all is a good part of it. Nothing they sell is that expensive, but it is scarce. No, it's, there's not much of it. Maybe the designers made five earrings, and that's all there is in the world. Um, but it's not luxury price, so it's not luxury, but it's got it's not mass produced, and you can really see the hand of the craftsman. Now, if you um, go and look at things like you know, this is a fossil watch, which I got for a present a while ago. This is mass produced, so you can see the camera focuses. It's incredibly shiny. Um, there's no blemishes. I can't see the hand of the maker because of the mass-produced nature of it. Um, and they want that. You know, we need to look at things like smartphones. There was a smartphone back about 15, 17 years ago um, called the Motorola Pebble. And there you actually put the phones on a bed of silk on the conveyor belt so that the screens wouldn't get scratched because back then didn't have the technology to make the screens not scratched, the case not scratched. Um, Anyhow, so mass produced really goes for that slick, can't see any hand of the maker because there's no real maker in there. It's all machine stamps. Anyway, if you were to look at a watch from a fine craftsman, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of pounds, handmade items, you actually get the same um, outlook in that everything is completely polished and you can't see any blemishes, any mark of the craftsman at all. And that's what they go to. And the greatest watch maker in the world has said that if you can see the hand of the craftsman in these watches, no one will buy them. So, interesting item. 
but in this context here, you want to see the head of the craftsman. So you want to kind of see a few um, marks from the file. You want to see a few rough edges. You want to see them burning a bit too much on the side of the leather. Now, all of these things which actually tell you this is made. Slight digression right now, but I'll get back off it. Things like this, they actually use stitching like this, which looks like you can see the hand of the craftsman. So they're trying to fake it, but you can't. Anyhow, um, so that tells me that the design of the site can't be too slick. So you've got an analog nature which needs to be preserved. So that's going to be talking about what kind of fonts we use, what kind of grid we love, what kind of transitions we use in the site. Um, we'll come on to that in a bit later on when I actually go through my initial ideas. The last bit I want to show you on this is um, it might be think of you know, old school uh, rock and roll. So it was you know, in the days before we had these really powerful lamps and no drum machines and everything was completely analog. And to get that like really distorted sound of the guitars, you had to crank the volume up so loud that the actual amp was like fizzing and falling apart. So this is um, the undertones. You know, so our teenage kicks so hard to beat every time she walks down the street. Another girl in the neighborhood, wish she was mine, she looks so good. I want to hold her one, hold her tight, get teenage kicks throughout through the night. You probably all know that song. It's dead famous. Um, you know, it's older than me. I wasn't even alive when it was written. And it still resonates. And that's so sound. And when I think of walking into the shop and what am I going to hear, I want to hear songs like The Undertones. I want to hear uh, The Kinks. I want to hear you know, really, really old school rock and roll, rockabilly, um, maybe even some skiffle, which is the precursor to rock to um, rock and roll, that kind of idea, you know, because all these things are very, very youthful. These aren't um, old things. These are things that really get you excited and you're trying things out new. You're discovering yourself. You're you know, breaking the boundaries and reinventing yourself in a mold no one's tried before. All of these things are captured here. So the short of it is <laughs> taking this pretty dry scale and run with it, I've discovered a lot of emotional things. That, and when I'm designing, I can draw on this to inspire me. When I've got a question like, how do I do a trade page tradition, I can come onto this. Now, the last thing of this part is this color spectrum, which was given out in the lecture, and it's pretty much going to see the psychology of what the shapes are. So, the shapes, what the colors are. So, you can kind of go through and highlights the parts which really relate to you and think, you know, this is um, friendliness, this is joy, energy, sincerity. These are all the areas which we really um, covered. Interestingly enough, there's no pink on here. So when I'm comparing the colors I chose in my mood board, this tool here is more of something to inspire you elsewhere than to be the key point of inspiration because there's no pink. And I think the pink is going to be a very, very key part of the design. But, you know, as we're going on things here and we're having ideas, it really made me think of things like the Interrobang, which I believe was invented in the 1920s. It's a combination between an exclamation part and a question mark, brings together, and it's absolutely beautiful piece of typography. So... And this really harkens back to like a retro innovative time that fits in very nicely with all these things here. So I kind of want to see, can I bring that into the design somehow? Because it's the missing symbol we should all fall in love with, which is very interesting. Anyhow, so we got all this stuff. Um, one thing I didn't show you is when I was looking at the website, I made this of mind map. And this is pretty much the um, M commerce site. So we've got blogs, we've got wholesale bags, booking a course, school of junk, festivals, shop, container, social media, all these areas here. So I mentioned earlier that when you're trying to digitize a website into an app, you don't necessarily want to chuck everything in because you've got to go back to the understanding part, the first part of design thinking of what we're trying to achieve, which is making a m-commerce site which the whole country can use. So we can knock some things out. So I'm going to use my highlighter pen here, and I'm going to highlight the stuff which I do not want to put in. So first of all, there's booking a course. Now, that is not something I want to be in version one of the site. Now, anything I knock out might be brought in later on, but that's not central to the idea of the 
M commerceness. So don't need that. And similarly, the courses, which is part of the school junk, I don't need to have any of that. Um, the festival stuff, once again, right now that's not needed because if people are um, signing up to the site with using and password, they've got an account, we can email them. That's CRM. So it's kind of cool. Social media, now that is important. I'm going to just like hash this. I want to integrate that somewhere in the site, but it's not going to be a key feature. So it's going to be there. Now the home page, I'm going to just rebrand this. That's a landing page. But that's a very important site. Now that's actually your coursework for the digital branding unit, but that's kind of useful. Um, your clothing, which is you know, very important. Your product page, essential. Um, we can actually add a thing in here, which is going to be shopping bag. We also need to have, where can I put it? Let's put them here. My account. Now, a little point here, when you're thinking about the shopping bag for my account, for this unit, for this part, you don't do that much, but bloody hell, when you try and do the, the um, user journey screenshots through from shopping bag through to delivery, you might be looking at hundreds. There's so many things that can be there. So don't ignore these. There's lots of things there. They're not sexy, but they are important. Anyway, moving on, we've got jewellery, that's really important, and lots of different things there, necklace, bracelets, earrings, pocket watches. We've got a gallery, and that's really nice and fun, I want to keep that. Wholesale, once again, not important for our e-commerce site. Um, we've got bags, that could be broadened to apparel maybe, um, but we want to keep that, it's again part of the offerings. And the blog, now I want to keep the blog, and the reason I want to keep the blog is that when you look at luxury fashion sites, what they have, what's really interesting, is that luxury fashion sites, they have a lot of experiential things, which is, you know, look at Burberry, the story of Burberry, the lifestyle of Burberry, what Burberry is. When you look at um, Topshop, you don't have the Topshop story. You don't have the Topshop experience and lifestyle. So this blog part, allows you to really embed the idea of the junk lifestyle, the junk story, um, the heritage that's brought in, which ties really nicely in with back to our mood board, all the ideas mentioned here. So what you see here, side point, is all these items, they're all inferencing each other. Let's get back to this. So we got this. Now what this is telling us is I've now got a very clear idea of the items I need to design for. So I need to design for, now I've got some kind of menu. Um, I've got categories. I've got elements we want to bring in, blogs, galleries. I've got the shop. Actually thinking about it, we don't need that either because the whole thing is a shop. We don't need a special thing for shopping because that's the entire site. And I want to integrate social media, make landing pages, have shopping bag on my account. So I've now got a very good map of what I need to design. And that's going to make my life so much easier because there's no point wasting time designing things or shoehorning things in that do not need to be there. So that's going to save me a lot of time. I've got lots of inspiration. And by the way, this, back to the um, value proposition canvas. I want to embed all these things when I'm working on. So when I'm designing, I'm going to be reflecting on all of this, not just one, but taking all of this. So I'm going to get on with that now. And you're going to see this in time lapse. So rather than sort of wasting loads of this time designing, uh, part two is going to be initial sketches. So see you in a bit.